uh, stacked with seeds more and more as, as we get them in. And tonight's lecture is on indoor seed starting, presented by Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens. And please welcome Kate and Eric from Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens. Hello. Hi. Okay, let's get this show going. Okay, so thank you, Beth. So as Beth said, Kate and I are Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens. We this is actually our side business. We're both in the IT in the IT field. Um, then Kate told you she works for National Grid. I'm not sure what she does. I'm in the IT field. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. Jack of all trades, master of none. That's right. I actually work for the Visiting Nurses Association. I actually manage the IT help desk, so we're both in the IT field. But we both have such a love of gardening that we turned it into a side project. So tonight's uh, presentation is going to be on starting your own seeds inside. Now, how many of you actually do start? <laughs> okay. So what are, the, uh, what are some of the reasons why you do it? Just personally, uh, what are some of the reasons? Because I have them from is here. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because the packages are enticing. Mm -hmm. But not to, not to start early, just, just to, to get it started in hopes that it will live indoors where it might not live outdoors. Right. I'm not a stronger. Right. So, so what we're going to talk about at first is the four things I like to, the reasons why I do it. Number one, it's more economical. You can go to the garden center and get a six pack of plants like this for $2.99. Or you can go to Walmart and get a pack of these for $1.50 and have about 400 seeds in here as opposed to six individual plants. Um, there are more varieties available. You notice you go to the garden centers, you go to the box stores, and they have a limited number of varieties and limited, limited number of colors. It's usually just restricted to what is the most popular. Um, but anybody who gets seed catalogs knows that you can thumb through here and find 15 to 20, maybe 25 pages on just tomatoes alone, where you go to like I'll use a place around here. I'm sure you're all familiar with Western Nurseries in, in Hopkinton. You could go there and they will have maybe four, five, six different varieties. Much more diverse selection when you do it from a catalog. You also get a jump start on the growing season. Let's, let's face it, around here, the growing season is not very long. We go from the last frost date, which is usually sometime the first, the last week of April or the first week of May, to the first frost, which is usually around Columbus Day in the middle of October. So you have that small five and a half month period in which to do things. And there are a lot of things around here that you cannot grow yourself unless you get a head start on them, such as tomatoes and eggplants and cucumbers and anything that loves heat. And the fourth one is what I call know the history. You go to a place, you look at the table, you're like, this looks phenomenal. These look great. Do you actually know how old these are? Do you know what was done to them before you actually bought them? Do you know if they've been treated properly? I've seen so many times, you go to the store, you buy this, you get home, it looks great, you plant it, and then a week and a half later, you're like, what happened to this? It's diseased, it's dying. What's going on? So when you do it yourself, you know what's happened to it. You know the history, that's what I like to call it. So, you get your pack of seeds, you get your soil medium, and then you say, what do I do now? The three key components to starting seeds are steady moisture, bottom heat, and a good starting medium. Now one thing I didn't put up here, I actually believe it might be on the next slide, but it probably should be on this one, is don't expose your seeds when you first plant them to light. It goes against everything you believe about in gardening, but seeds actually do better germinate better in the dark than they do with light. Um, steady moisture, that speaks for itself. Bottom heat, I'm going to pass this around, Kate, if you want to. This is a, a, heat, a heat map. You can get it at any garden center. You can get them on Amazon. You can actually even get them at Walmart. You can plug that in, and that will actually warm up to roughly about 75, 80, 85 degrees and you put your seed, you put your six packs on there and it will actually help to heat the bottom of the soil to 
aid in germination. Um, they're twenty-five bucks or so. Yeah, it's not, a little investment. Yeah, they're, they're not much, and they, they will they will pay for themselves pay for themselves year after year after year. So it's a one-time investment. Um, good starting medium. I assume everybody is familiar with seed starting mix. You get at garden center, Walmart, anything. You know, one and a half, two cubic foot bag will cost you about seven or eight dollars, if that. Um, has anybody seen these before? These little jiffy pots, these expandable pots. Put them in water, warm water, wait about, I don't know what was it? 15, 20 minutes. 15, yeah, thank you. And they pop right about up. 15, 20 minutes, and these will actually expand to probably about four or five times the regular size. And then you just put the seed in here, keep it moist, and there you go. So, yep, yeah, so we just talked about this. Let me make a comment yeah, um, on that, okay? Yeah. So one of the things that's different about the seed starting mix than a potting mix is the fact that the seed starting mix is milder because when you have a plant uh, that's growing, uh, the seed that's starting, uh, it has a husk on it, obviously. Seeds are hard. Obviously, the plant that comes up is soft. So when the plant germinates, you know, when it starts to turn from a seed to a plant, it has a hard, that, that uh, material, the seed material, actually feeds the plant and allows it to grow for the first, first while. So it, when you talk about soil, you know, the class we do on raised beds or what have you, we talk about what you add to your uh, raised beds or, you know, your in-ground garden or whatever to get them to grow. You don't need that stuff. All you need with the seed material, the, the seed starting material, is something very lightweight yes. and uh, that doesn't, you know, doesn't let your seeds get crushed up and lets the air in and lets the, the water flow through it. I mean, some people honestly even start their seeds in dryer lint. So, and it won't kill them. Of course, you have to transplant them once you have the first true set of leaves, the second set of leaves. You have to transplant them perhaps in, in uh, something a little more stable. But, um, but when they first come up, they don't need any, any harsh type of potting soil yeah. when, you're trying, when you're starting your veggie seeds. Right. So. You, right. I'm sorry. Was someone going to? Oh, I thought I heard somebody say something. Okay, yeah. So like Kate said, the big difference between seed starting mix and regular soil mix is, you know, you go, you buy the bag of potting soil, and it has the fertilizer composition on it, the three different numbers. You do not want that when you're trying to start seeds. Too much fertilizer or fertilizer at all when a seed is trying to germinate or when it's young is not a good idea. It doesn't need it because all the food that the plant needs is stored in the husk of the seed. So, so you're saying that seeds starting mix doesn't have that or does it? It does not have does, a lot of nutrients yeah, in it. It, does, it, it. it has what are called, not to, not to get too technical, but I'm a master gardener so I'm going to get technical anyway. Um, there are what are called, you know, there are the three big components, the uh, fertilizer components, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Macronutrients. Yeah. Macronutrients, right. There's also what are called micronutrients or trace elements, things like copper and boron and, um, what's another one? Magnesium, thank maybe, ca uh, calcium. Yeah. yeah, thank you. The seed starting mix has that, but it doesn't have a high level of the NPK because it doesn't need it when, it's first, when it first germinates. It'll burn it. Sometimes you put too much. I mean, I remember when I first started growing seeds, I, I said, geez, these aren't growing fast enough. Let me give them something to kill them. Of course, I didn't realize it. So I'd give them a little <laughs> squirt of this, a little squirt of that. Forget yeah. it. Bad idea. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes they don't come up. That's another thing to, to talk about is sometimes um, not all seeds in that pack of 25 or not all seeds that you harvest from last year's you know, cucumber are, are going to take. So you have to realize that too. Don't get discouraged. That's why you always, you know, typically it'll tell you on the package or you can always send us an email, but most seeds, um, I, I put at least two in the hole. Except corn, that's a big one. And maybe peas I don't or beans because they're, they're big. But basically tomatoes or whatever, I put two or three in a hole. If two or three come up, that's great. If one of them kind of dies and I just pick it off with my fingernails, making sure not to pull too hard to, to pull the, uh, the, the uh, roots out. Right, exactly. Okay, so we talked about, or uh, we will talk about um, timing 
of your seeds. So around here we have you know what's called early season and mid season. The early season things are early season crops are ones that will typically take a light frost or snow. They're not bothered by cold. Broccoli, cauliflower, lettuce, kale, Brussels sprouts, peas are just a few. Basically, if you're growing a plant for the leaf, it is considered cool season. If you're growing it for the fruit, for the most part, it is a warm season. Things like tomatoes, peppers, squash, beans, corn, eggplants, things that you're actually growing for the fruit require a lot of heat. You know, there's a misnomer there. They, they say, uh, uh, you, you know the summer squash, like patty pan and crooked neck and, you know, the yellow squash and zucchini, they're all summer squash. And the winter squash are harder, you know, like the butternut, uh, spaghetti squash, uh, delicata, acorn squash, buttercup, all kinds of, you know, the hard ones. But they call them winter squash because if you leave them till the vine completely dies, they're good way up, you know, in, well into the fall. They don't, they don't, you know, they can take a beating because they're really hard. Yep. However, it's a misnomer thinking that, you know, you can start them in, in the, you know, when it's still winter because they're very, they're actually very fragile when they're, when they first grow. So they have to wait until the season. And although the tomatoes and the peppers, I have tomatoes and peppers, I'm supposed to start them around now or, or maybe till the middle of, middle of April. You can, you can start your seeds indoors, but I don't start my um, uh, squash, cucumber, and melon. Actually, it's all, they're all in the same family, the big family. I don't start them because they don't really, you, you know, when you go in the, in, go to Walmart or something and you see the plants that they're selling or, or Home Depot or what have you, they're selling big tomato plants, right? And big, but you see the starts for the, uh, the zucchinis are really small because zucchinis don't like growing, you know, in, indoors. They, they, don't, they don't like it too much. So they, I just plant them when they're about yay high and, uh, you know, after a few weeks. They also so, grow so fast, it's very difficult. They grow they fast contain, and they tangle them, up and, small, and they, they just don't like to grow, to grow indoors. Right. So. But there's a lot of um, there's a lot of seeds you can start in, um, indoors. Other than other than that kind, there's um, let me see. You get the broccoli, the, the the brassicas. I have um, mustard. Uh, mustard leaves that are actually delicious. Uh, collard. I'm supposed to eat more greens. They say eat greens, eat greens. So I'm going to start eating greens. If I don't like them, I'll put them in a smoothie and put some fruit in there and make them make them taste better. But uh, so there's a lot of stuff you can grow in the cool season and. You know, in the warm season, like like we say, we have a we have a, a presentation dedicated to to um, uh, tomatoes. There's actually a Facebook group or a page some guy set up uh, to to uh, he wants to get you know sell some of his seeds. He's he's got connections, I guess. He has four thousand different kinds of tomato seeds: purple ones, yellow ones, tiny ones, four pound, five pound tomato, all kinds, all kinds of tomatoes. Cherry tomatoes, all, all different kinds. So. And see, and I grew five a couple of years ago and thought that was a lot. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> this, yeah. Sorry, you got me out numbered 800 so, to 1, guy. <laughs> so you're saying don't start the mid season stuff indoors? No, no, do start the mid season stuff, the warm season stuff indoors. Otherwise, the growing season is not long enough. Okay. Yeah. We're not going to direct at the same time you're starting the cool season stuff? No. no late. You, so, Kathy, anything that you have. Anything that you, you want to start, um, and we're going we're gonna to get, uh, I'll send you one. I think I, we might have one, I might have one posted. Um, this schedules, and when, you, when you're on the back of, when, you're, when you look on the back of a seed, uh, it'll tell you, or, or there's a, we're in zone 6A, and it'll tell you when you start, when you start your seeds. Yeah. I know, um, oh, what's, who, um, Farmer's Almanac has, has a page dedicated to when you when you start your different seeds right. um, so yeah they're, they're a little bit different but now you can well, just easily now you can start your tomatoes your peppers what they call nightshades tomatoes peppers and eggplant and probably I don't know mid-April Eric is it when do you start your, your cucumbers I usually direct seed my cucumbers or you can direct seed your yeah. cucumbers too if you so, want but if you're going to if you're going to start your cucumbers early around here, I would do it the first week of April. Oh. Yeah. 
There's actually a slide further on in the presentation that shows a chart of when to start things and also how to read the back, of, interpret the back of the seed packet, and it has the information on it. There's a whole bunch of stuff in the back of the seed packet. Of course, some people, you might want to take stuff from your last year's veggies and, and plant them in, that doesn't have a seed packet. So you have to go online and, and look at Farmer's Almanac or just, uh, just Google on uh, uh, Agricultural Zone 6A starting times or something, and, it, and it'll show you. Or, or just ask me. Send me an email. I have my cards down there. There's actually... Um, I should probably put the link in here, but there's a very good resource, um, johnnyseeds.com, one of my favorite catalogs, one of my go-tos. Their website, under the tools section, actually has a seed starting calculator that if you just go there and punch in the average date of your last frost, which, like I said, for us is usually any time between April 26th and May 10th, it will tell you when to start your Your season. last frost is April 26th, you April put 26th in. April 26th to May right. 10th, usually in that two-week window. Oh, okay, right, yeah. right. Um, it will tell you when to start your seeds inside, how to do it, and when to transplant them outside. So uh, we talked about direct sowing versus transplanting. Some things actually don't like being transplanted, which is what you would direct sow. Things like cucumbers, the things that don't like having the roots disturbed. Cucumbers, melons, squash, root crops for obvious reasons. When I say root crops, I mean things like parsnips, and carrots and radishes and onions and beets don't like to have their roots disturbed. Uh, beans and peas probably, even though you can go to the garden center and you get bean and pea start, starts, I always say direct sow them because it's just so ridiculously easy and so quick. They're one of the first things up in only about two or three days. Well that's the whole thing too about peas and beans. If you start them indoors under your lights, um, they're going to grow so tall so fast mm -hmm. that you know so you can, I mean, you can do that. You know, some people typically beans, um, or peas, you, you plant them, and, um, you know, when they're coming up, you know, maybe a, a foot high or whatever, you want to plant some more so you'll have a continuous growth throughout the season. Um, so, but, but you're right, Eric, starting them inside can be kind of a problem, especially when you have space constraints under your lights, unless, of course, you right. have a big, big, beautiful bay window. Mm -hmm. You have a bay window? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good. That's, that's one for me, one for you. For yeah, sure. there you go. Time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, we'll pay you in cucumbers. Have that much, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, um, <laughs> another thing about peas, you know, when Kate said they grow tall, it made me think of another thing. Peas are actually vines that climb. And if you start them too soon and they start sending out the tendrils and you have them in a six pack, go to luck trying to separate them from each other. Yeah. Um, things that you would transplant, that transplant easily, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, winter squash, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, lettuce, and again, these are just some of the, some of the things that are easy enough to start under a light or on a heat mat that don't mind actually being transplanted, or some of the things, like I said, where the season around here is just too short to direct seed. Like tomatoes and peppers, believe it or not, if you were to grow them down south, they're actually perennials. But around here, we don't have a long enough season. Actually, eggplants are perennials too. So the thing is about tomatoes is every year, I have very fertile, I have a lot of raised beds and they're very fertile because I work my soil, I compost, I dig, I buy um, composted cow manure and, and supplement. I mean, I, I do a lot, um, you know, with those. But, um, you know, tip, typically I have a bunch of tomatoes coming up mid-season that I have to have homes for. Of course, it may be a seed that uh, fell in there like three years, so I never know what kind of tomato it's actually going to be, but my soil is very fertile, and you could never do that. You could never plan a garden and expect, you know, your uh, tomatoes, because they're not the plants. That they actually, These are actually regenerating from, I'm sure, from a seed, because I pull all my tomato plants, but, but they're definitely fragile, uh, and the best way to do it is either you buy the plants or you or you start them from seed. And inevitably, no matter how diligent you are with your harvest, you're always going to have one or two tomatoes at least at the end of the year that are still on the vine that rotted after the frost hit. And then they yep. drop their seeds, and then come April, you have a tomato infestation. Yeah. yeah it happens to me. I pot them, actually, and I the find homes for them, typically. That was the only way I got tomatoes last year with all the rain that we had. Yeah. I, my wife, my son, and I had a plot at the community garden in Uxbridge, and everybody knows how lousy the weather was last year. It wasn't until the middle of June where everything was dried out enough to plant 
and the only thing that actually did anything were the things that love water and the volunteer tomatoes from the year before. <laughs> just, last year was just not a good year. So most of the tomatoes you see in the store and you go to buy them and they're say like, you know, you see some that are like this or some that are like that. Yeah. They've been started like say beginning of April. I've never done tomatoes by seed, but it would be kind of fun to do. I just always look for like the tallest. Right. They would, right. They would be tomatoes. started, they would be started usually. Indoors somewhere. In, in, in the middle of March. As a matter of fact, today, as a matter of fact, March 15th is usually the day. Wow. That, I, that I start my tomatoes. Oh, wow. So it depends. Where, where are you look? Are you looking at, are you looking at like Home Depot, one of those places like that? Yes. Yeah. That's Bonnie plants, and they started down south, and I'm sure they start them indoors, so under huge right. uh, green, in huge greenhouse. So I, I have, I have good, I find good quality with Bonnie plants. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've done many of them, but then again, I, I, I came, became too cheap. And growing from seeds is like a challenge to me, more oh, of a no, challenge than buying see, them. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah cool. um, one thing before I forget, though, I wanted to touch on what you just said. You always look, when you go to buy plants, you always look for the tallest one. Tallest is not necessarily better, because remember, it's in this small container. Right. And the bigger it is, probably the more stressed it is also. Mm -hmm. You probably see six packs of tomato plants that look like, you know, probably about yay high. And you're like, yes. oh, my God, these already have blossoms on them. Right. Terrific. Right. No, no. Well, I do look for them sometimes along the last year. I got one with a blossom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I know what you mean. Sometimes they're too skinny, but yeah. I try to look for the tall, healthy, not the right. short, short, you know what right. I mean? Yeah. It's better to go in between. But yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. And you transplant them in, uh, in the ground or in big pots? You know, I'd love to plant them myself. Yeah. That, so cool. yeah. When, you, when you plant them, do you plant them deep? Because what you can actually do with a tomato is break off all of the leaves except for the cluster of leaves at the top. Because okay. if you ever feel a tomato stem, that was very fuzzy, mm -hmm. those are all immature roots. Ah, okay. So what you can actually do, my grandfather and I, what we used to do would be to dig a trough and actually pinch off all the leaves except for what's on the top mm -hmm. and plant it sideways. Lay it down like that so that the roots will all form along the stem in the trench and Mother Nature will eventually send it growing the right way. Interesting. Yeah. So, I've heard of that too. What's that? I've heard of that too. Yeah. So we were talking about um, when to plant things. Here's a chart that will show you, you know, what you can plant when the soil reaches what temperature and how many days it's going to take to germinate. These here represent the absolute minimum that the soil can be if you want the seed to germinate. So 35 degrees, things such as this, even though you see best here. 65, 70, 75, 75. This is why you need a laser pointer so my shadow's not in the way. <laughs> um, we'll germinate at 35 degrees. It'll just take this number of days to do it. So what you're looking for ideally is here where it says best. And that's what your, I don't know why corn says 95 degrees. That's a little bit too warm. Mm. <laughs> but you get, the, you get the idea. You're not going to take a tomato seed where it says here, best is 80, minimum 50, and planted in soil that's 35 or 40 degrees, because you'll be there in the middle of July when everybody else has gotten tomatoes, and you're like, where's my plant? Yeah. So, um, does anybody have any questions on anything that we've mentioned so far? Anything that we probably should have mentioned but didn't? Okay. How easy are Brussels sprouts? I hear they're pretty easy. To start? Yeah. Yeah, they're very easy. Okay. Brussels sprouts are just a very long season plant. Okay. It, it's funny, they need cool temperatures to germinate, mm -hmm. warm temperatures to grow, right. and cool temperatures again to mature. Okay. Yeah. They're usually one of the first things in the garden and one of the last things out. Have you ever have you ever grown cabbage, broccoli, kale or any of that? Broccoli, yes. Kale, yes. So those those are uh, brassicas are uh, for me the the pests love them so i get a lot of a lot of um, you know infestation so i have to do a lot of a lot of i use organic uh, remedies but those in, in brussels sprouts as well sometimes they'll the the um, the cabbage bugs will just skeletonize the the whole the whole leaves yeah. so you got to watch that and you have to spray we have some organic remedies if you want after this if we have time, uh, we can go over what we use. We actually have an entire lecture series that's called The Organic Approach. No. Um, Brussels sprouts, though, like I said, they're a very long, long season plant. They're usually, if you know what the term DTM means, days to maturity. Mm -hmm. From seed to the time you actually pick the sprouts off of the stem 
is usually somewhere between 110 and 120 days. So it is a full four-month process. Yeah. Now, I actually had probably about, what, what year were we even in, 2018? About four or five years ago, probably the most gorgeous Brussels sprout plant I ever had. It was about six and a half, not six and a half, maybe about five and a half feet tall, maybe about this big around. It actually looked like a tree. And it's funny the way they grow because as the plant grows, the sprouts will actually develop on the stalk itself. You know, the leaves stick out from the stalk and you have the area of the plant in any plant where the leaf attaches its stem, itself to the stem, it's called the petiole, and the bud will actually develop there. And as they grow, what you're supposed to do is break the leaves off of the bottom of the plant so the sprouts can get exposure to sunlight. So at the end of the season, what you really have is this thing that looks like a palm tree <laughs> with Brussels sprouts all over it. And I really did a number on my hands. My million dollar invention is a tool that will actually take the Brussels sprouts off of the stock for you. So you're not there like this. <laughs> because I did them, you know, I grow them, my in-laws take them for Thanksgiving every year. My, my wife, my son, and I love them, but we have so many that we give them to my in-laws. And I remember just telling my father-in-law after half a plant, I'm like, Jack, I don't know how many of these that you want, but I think I've got carpal tunnel now, and I can't do this anymore, because the plant was just so thick. It was like try, trying to break branches off of a tree. Yeah. I don't like them. I wish I did. They're really good for you. Yeah. High fiber and all that. I wish I liked them. Oh, they're them. fantastic. You know, they, they, they get a bad rap because of, you know... Because they don't taste good. <laughs> No, come, on. <laughs> come on now. You have to cook them right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Bacon, exactly. yeah, bacon. Exactly. Yeah. You know, that's, that, that's what I'll Slice say about, thin, you know. Throw them in the, hot, the uh, iron pan, you know, yep. roasted is great, too. Oh, yep. that's good. Mm -hmm. yeah, squash all the squash on top, you're good to go. Yep, that's what, that's what I say that. about, about a lot of the vegetables that scare people. Now, my son is four years old, and luckily he's being bought up by two farmers because my wife loves this also. And you have never seen a four-year-old little boy eat his vegetables any faster than this. He loves Brussels sprouts. He eats raw broccoli. He loves asparagus. Par uh, carrots, and, yep. um, carrots and peppers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, remember, remember the hunger strike he went on last summer? We brought him to the garden. Oh. My, my son just knows, as a, as a side note, got really sick last summer and just put himself on a self-imposed hunger strike for about a week where he would just take one bite of something and be scared that he'd puke it back up again. And I was terrified until I said, Bud, you want to go to the garden? He said, yeah. And he took a t uh, green pepper off the plant and started eating it like an apple. <laughs> and ordinarily, I would have said, what are you doing? But I looked at my wife and said, he hasn't eaten in a week. Let him have the yeah. damn thing. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, that's what, I say. <clears throat> that's what I say. If you don't like a particular vegetable, you probably haven't had it prepared the right way. Kate? Well, I'm having Kathy <laughs> cook it for me, so yeah. <laughs> Okay, so moisture is critical to good germination. The last thing that you want to do is let your seed dry out because the only way that so the food that's stored in the husk of the seed that we talked about gets released is through osmosis, when the seed actually gets wet and then it can diffuse the um, nutrients out into the soil. Consistent temperatures. Um, anybody have an electric skillet at home? probably outdated. Geez, I haven't had one of those in 20 years. Yeah, well, <laughs> welcome to the real world, yeah. Um, but you know, anything with a thermostat, you know, temperature goes up and down, you know, thermostat goes on and off all the time, temperature goes up, off, up and down all the time, and you don't get what you really need, which is a consistent, maintained temperature. So that's why I say consistent temperature is good, that's why I like that heat mat. You plug it in, it gets to a certain point, and it stays there. It doesn't go up, doesn't go down. Don't bury the seed too deep. Now, this is going to fly in the face of what I talked about earlier when I see that seeds don't need light to germinate. They don't need a lot of light. But what you certainly also don't want to do is take your seed and drill it down five inches into the soil where it's not going to be able to see at all, get light at all, because also, let's face it too, it's still very weak at that, <coughs> at that age. And it, you don't necessarily want to have to have it travel too far. Then, but, so the rule of thumb, First of all, if you're buying seeds and you have a packet of seeds, if you look on the back, it'll tell you how far down to sow it. Mm -hmm. When you have a big seed like a pea, that's a strong seed, or, or a, a bean. That, that seed, you can put that, that down an inch and a half, and that's going to shoot right up. You're not going to have any issues. 
but tomato seeds, they're little. Or uh, I'm trying to think what what else is a little tiny. A carrot, carrot seed, a carrot, carrot seed is a little tiny, little yeah. scrawny thing. If you if you plant it down, what's going to happen is it's going to try to go to shoot up, you know, to to germinate, and it's going to get halfway there. It's going to run out of steam. I I told you they it it eats that husk. It uses that husk, you know, to for for nutrition. It's it's going to run out of steam and and it's going to die. You're going to say where the heck where the heck are my carrots? Well, you didn't you didn't read the back of the seed pack, right. so. And there are some actually, like Kate said, we would actually, the stronger ones that you can, you know, push down, but there are other ones like the carrot seed or lettuce seeds are also very tiny and hard to wield that you actually do better off just laying them on top of the soil and just putting a little bit more soil over the top yeah. of it, just barely covering it. Uh, keep away from light until germination is occurring. There is a slide and a video towards the end of this presentation that's going to explain why in further detail, but I'll get into it right now. Show of hands, and if you don't raise your hand, you're lying to me. <laughs> Who's guilty of starting a seed and having a stem that's probably about this long with two tiny little seeds on the top? <laughs> because it's about seven or eight inches long because you either gave, you had your light after it germinated too far away from the I can't talk to them, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Away from the top of where you have the seed. You never want your light, after you put underneath, you never want your light any more than one inch to an inch and a half away from the top of the plant. And the reason why is because there is a phenomenon inside of a plant that's called phototropism, which is the tendency of a plant to grow towards a light source. So if you have your seed here and you have your light way up here, the seed's going to say, hey, there's the light, and it's going to stretch for it. And it's going to stretch for it. And plants don't multitask well. Mm -hmm. So what happens is while it's, trying, while it's growing up, it's not growing down and rooting. Right. So it's not getting a good hold. It's not becoming strong. It doesn't have a good base. So it's going to come up and it's going to die. Mm -hmm. So that, that's called a leggy plant. Yeah. And Kate mentioned this at the beginning. Don't get discouraged. Don't expect 100% germination from everything that you plant. If you do get 100% germination, I'll be honest with you, you've probably done something wrong. Because there's always going to be a dud or two in a pack of seeds that just doesn't germinate. Sometimes you get some seeds and, you know, there's also a package of seeds that you purchase has a, has a life cycle. Yeah. You know, a rule of thumb, tomato seeds can last up to eight years. I mean, the, the, you, you can research that as well. I may, may have some kind of document on it. But if you have a seed pack that's kind of older and you really like that, that type of... Try it, and you know what? If it has a 50% germination rate, instead of putting one in the hole to, or two in the hole, maybe you'll put four in the hole, and then, you know, if you get too many, you'll, you'll clip some off, but you might as well try it. I mean, you know, you might as well use up, use up your seeds, so. Right. And another good way, if you have an old pack of seeds, you know, on the, um, on the fold of the bottom of the packet of seeds, you always see a date that says, like, packed for 2018 or packed for whatever year they were packed in. If you want to know if your seed that's about two, three, four years old is any good, take your seeds, wrap them in a couple of damp paper towels, and, uh, and put them in a plastic bag and throw them on top of your refrigerator for about three or four days. Because the heat that's radiated off the fridge will actually help to germinate it too. And then you can see if those seeds are viable or not. Okay, so we were talking earlier about the, you know, the different times and the different ways to plant. And this is, if you look at the back of the seed packet, We'll tell you how far down to do it. How many seeds? Is, uh, yeah, this is burping. And they will have this map here with the legend that shows you the best time to direct sow. Um, there are other ones that you, um, for transplanting, like on the back of a tomato seed packet, will have two maps. One for direct sowing, one for starting indoors. And the direct sowing on things like that around here will actually be a great big NA for not applicable over our area. And it will also tell you, again, it will give you illustrated instructions here and step-by-step -step instructions here. So four to six seeds, about three inches apart, and hill. Hill is just a fancy way of saying a group of seeds. You mound it up, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cover with one inch of firm soil, firm weight, weight, blah, 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 blah. Gives you the full step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it and what to do. Thin seedlings to th two to three per hill when they're one to two inches high. So, but again, this is specific for pumpkins, but this slide here just gives you an idea of how all the instructions are usually on the back of your seed packet or 
in the case of old reliable Johnny's, no nice pictures, but full instructions on the front pad, on the front of the seat pack. And if you don't see the instructions, you're right, you're right. Some, some, sometimes you, you can buy a pack of seeds and the package is real fancy and pretty and all that, but it doesn't have what you need. You can just Google it. Or like I say, this, or, or go up to the Burpee website or the Johnny's website or one of those places or uh, Farmer's Almanac doc, uh, dot com and you, you can find that information. Yeah. And again, like I was telling you, you can see down here every seed on every every pack on the bottom fold will tell you the year that those seeds were packed. And it's probably time for me to get rid of those seeds, plus I can't grow a three hundred pound pumpkin anyway. <laughs> I think the best I ever did was about eighty. Oh my goodness. I think, yeah, my grandfather and I had an 80 pound pumpkin one year that actually almost pulled down the fence it was growing on. Yeah. You had to grow on a fence? We had to grow on a fence with the old, with an old in, in a pantyhose sling. Pantyhose and a burlap bag. And it almost pulled down the fence. I have an award winning um, um, giant pumpkin guy in my gardening group. I had to introduce you to him. Then we had, then we had a, another one because pumpkins obviously are a vine and they spread out far. That same neighbor of my grandfather's that I was talking about earlier who got sick and tired of our zucchini had a uh, five foot long pumpkin vine in her yard with a 50 pound pumpkin on it that she used to have to turn her, make her lawnmower go around. <laughs> <laughs> and she actually called my grandfather one day and she said, Leo, I assume this pumpkin's mine since it's in my yard. And he said, yeah. <laughs> okay, great, now what? So at the first sign that your seed has germinated, Remove the tray from the heat mat and put it under your light. Because in addition to not getting a lot of light to make a plant leggy, too much bottom heat after the seed has germinated will also cause legginess. Your light source should never be more than one to one and a half inches from the top of the seedling and always overhead, like we said earlier. So even if you only have it an inch to an inch and a half above, but you have it off to the side, the plant is going to grow in the direction of the light. That's why you want it overhead, not off to the side. Otherwise, it starts going sideways. If you have a really sunny, just, I don't want anyone to get discouraged. If you have a really sunny uh, bay window or, or something, mm -hmm. you, can, you can certainly give it, give it a whirl and see if it works. Right. If, but I would just recommend if you do it in a window where you have light only coming in from one side, is every couple of days rotate just it. Just turn it, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. As cer as certainly as they get larger. Right, and that, that's after the seed is germinated. I would, not, I would not try to germinate seeds in a window. I don't know about you. No, you germinate them under the mat, right? right. I mean, if you have the mat, you can germinate them under the mat. I'm sure it's possible, but the, it's better to ger I think you get a better yield if you, if you, germinate, if you germinate them under a mat. Or you can even get a, um, if you have a heating pad, you can use that, but I have them that turn off, yep. you know, every once they say, you know, they, they figure yeah, yeah. you're sleeping or whatever, fire hazard or whatever, yep. and they turn off. You know, heating pad, like Kate said, I've even seen people use an electric blanket. Yeah, as that would work. As a substitute for a, um, for a heat mat, but of course it's an electric blanket has a thermostat on it. I've had my, I've had my heating, um, my heat mats, I think it's like 10 years now, and they, and they both work, and 25 bucks a piece. Yep. I mean, I don't know. Trip typically, we gardeners are fru are few frugal people. I'm cheap myself, but I know most gardeners are frugal people, and you don't want to spend a lot of money. You you can really overdo it too, trying to trying to scale up. Right. And then the other thing about the the lights, uh, not using the incandescent lights. There are several kind of grow lights, and not all of them cost a lot of money. You can get them in. They'll just you know the the word grow light. Uh, Google that, or you you see them, but um, they, they don't get hot, they emit uh, dif a different uh, ray and, uh, that, that help, the, help the plants along, different spectrum. spectrum. Um, and, um, you know, they, they have them, they're not much. You can go nuts and spend um, uh, probably hundreds of dollars. You can get LED lights, so you can get uh, <laughs> neon lights. Or, what do they call the ones? Fluorescents. The fluorescent lights. Yeah. It's, a, it's a regular old fluorescent, you know, four foot long shop light. Even doesn't even oh. necessarily have to say grow light on it. Really? Yeah, you just don't want to use an incandescent like 60 or 75 watt bulb because they give out heat. Um, funny slash tragic story. Probably about 25 years or so ago, I said, you know what? I wonder if I could actually get a, a grapefruit seed to germinate. So I put it on a heat mat, and eight days later it came up. I was so excited. 
I had no grow light. But I said, you know what I have? I have my desk lamp. Let's put it under that. Two days later, it was brown. Because uh, it gave out too much heat. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, not that it would have mattered. It would have taken probably another 20 years to get fruit from it from seed anyway. But right. it, was, it was just the idea. It was traumatic. I cried. I was 15. <laughs> so, so just to go back to that, so there are all kind of grow lights, and you can get them. I guess you could probably use a shop light. I would get them, but I have a lot of lights, like I say, but very rarely do I buy them um, full price. I go on Craigslist or I go on a sale group on Facebook because I'll, I'll tell you why. It does, as Eric said, it doesn't really take the do-all, end-all, special lights to grow the veggies that, that I grow and Eric grows. But it does take the fancy LED lights and all this stuff to grow marijuana, which I don't grow. <laughs> but it's legal here. And even if it wasn't, people, people get rid of their old lights and they want to scale up to the newest, you know. So, so you know, I take the old lights. I'll buy the, or, um, not that I know these, on Craigslist, you know, well, it's selling, selling a whole batch of lights. So I end up getting them for, you know, 50 cents on the dollar because these people want to, want to scale up and, you know, increase their their capacity to, because they need fancy lights, to, I guess, to grow that stuff, but, um, so I, I get them, you know, people move or whatever, you usually can find some grow lights on Craigslist or, um, or on your Facebook groups. Mm -hmm. So you keep the lights and the mat on 24-7? You keep the mat on 24-7, yeah. But, you know, when it comes to the light, just like, just like the sun, when the sun goes down, because plants do need a, peri a dormant period, to grow also. Oh, okay. Yeah. So so, so what I yeah, what I do when my plants have grown and germinated and I put them under the light, I will plug the light in when I get up in the morning at about five AM and I'll unplug it that night at about eight or eight thirty, give it fifteen to sixteen hours of light. Yeah. Because let's face it, in the uh, late June to mid July, when stuff is really flourishing outside, you do have we do have fifteen to sixteen hours of sunlight. You know, we have a sunrise a little before five and at sunset a little before nine. So there's about 16 hours there also. So, yeah, and they need, they need that time in the evening. So I, I water mine before I go to bed because, you know, the lights are off and they, they take a nice drink and then they go to sleep for the night. So. <laughs> so. I saw someone watering with a spray bottle. Yes. Is that the yes. Thing? As a matter of fact, I was going to Mention that I don't have my spray bottle here because I believe my wife put bleach in it to clean the tub. <laughs> <laughs> but when you first uh, when you first plant, the last thing that you want to do is to take water and just dump it right over the top of it because you don't want to dislodge the seed. You want as much soil to seed contact as you can get. So you do, will just yeah use a, a mist bottle or a spray bottle, which actually brings segues perfectly into what we want to talk about next. You planted your seed, you followed all the instructions that Kate and I have given you tonight, and then you go and you look, and you have something that looks like this, which is called damp off. And you say, what happened? Well, what more than likely happened is you probably either watered it too much, or it was in too cool an environment. It's usually characterized by weakness in the stem of a young plant, and you can see that tomato plant right there, how it has, how the cell structure here, right in the middle, has broken down. Really blinding. I want to You see how the cell structure in the middle of that stem has broken down from too much water. Um, so make sure that your plants are kept at a minimum of 65 degrees and do not overwater them. And provide good air circulation around your seedlings too, because as the plants transpire, you'll probably notice the moisture that they let off on the leaves. And if they're too crowded together, you're going to introduce things like mildew and mold and other types of, you know, fungus and things like that. So one thing that I've seen people do that I haven't actually done is to get a small oscillating fan that just blows gently back and forth on your plants, but make sure it oscillates because you don't want it blowing directly on the plants in one direction because that'll just cause them to transpire and lose their moisture too quickly. And use a sterile potting mix to start your seeds. Like what Kate was saying earlier, nothing with an NPK composition in it. No fertilizer in your seed starting mix. Leggyness, again, anybody who says they've never done this or never seen this is lying to me because everybody is guilty of this at one point or another. 
it's a real tricky thing. Mm -hmm. Once the once you have some seeds like that, a little if it's a little six pack, right when you see them pop up, you got to put them under the light. They, they will they will go leggy. You mm -hmm. you, you really got to you really got to watch it. You got to this is something you have to tend on a on a daily basis. But you you have to know when to do it or or you can lose them. The other thing and that is, is very fast. when you put in when you put in say you have a Say you have a, uh, a, a seed starter thing like this, right? Let me show you the, the big one, yep. like this. And you put and you put in half half beans and half tomatoes. Well, that isn't going to work because your beans are going to be already, you know, already popping up, and your tomatoes aren't. So when you're going to put it under the light? So that's a, that's a very good point too. When you when you use a seed cell like this, try not to mix things that have different days to maturity. Like I wouldn't put lettuce in here that comes up in four to six days and then celery over here that takes anywhere between 14 and 21 because how are you going to separate it like Kate said. So like we said caused by the light source being too far away from the seedling when it first starts growing. It's actually stretching to find that light. Uh, certain plants such as tomatoes will recover if you bury them deep. If That's, you catch it before they die. Right, right. If you catch it before they die like we talked about earlier all the little hairs on a tomato stem being actually immature roots. Tomatoes will recover from legginess. Eggplants may, peppers may. Other things that are vines, like cucumbers and winter squash may also, but things such as lettuce are not gonna recover from a leggy start. So the best course of action is usually to start over. Sun scald, anybody seen this before? If you expose your plants to too much natural sunlight, too too soon. They will develop bleed spots like this, caused by overexposure to sun at an early age. Best course of action is to contain hardening off to a maximum set time. And what hardening off is, you're going to see it in the video that we're going to play next, is after your seedlings have developed what's called their second set of true leaves. You know, every time a seed comes up, you have the two seeds that come up first that are called the seed leaves. And then you have all the other seeds, excuse me, all the other leaves that are the actual true leaves of the plant. What you know, help but me. the plant looks like. Thank you. So the, the, plant the looks like. when your plant comes up from the soil, it needs some help. So uh, nature gives it these two these two leaves that help push it through the soil. Mm -hmm. Those are not the true leaves of the plant. They all pretty much look the same, whether it's a cabbage or whether it's a pepper or what. They all pretty much look the same. Once those come out, you're in, it looks it looks really good, but you're still not out of the woods. You really don't know if the plant's going to actually uh, take. But once you see the, the first the, 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 the real t the first set of true leaves come out, a couple of you know the, the tomato plant leaves that you know look like a tomato plant, uh, then uh, then you're then you're all set. It, you'll, you'll be pretty sure that it's a, a viable a viable plant. Right. So. so so what hardening off is is once your plants have developed their second to third set of true leaves, you bring them outside and expose them to the elements for a short period of time, gradually increasing that period of each time, day each day. So you maybe start out with maybe a half hour for a couple of days, then move up to an hour for a couple of days, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it just leads to less transplant shock when it comes time to actually put them outside. Because they will go into they will go, they into, will go into shock. You can't take a plant, um, you know, from seventy degrees, constant seventy degrees or whatever in your in your house, and then bring it out into into you know I'm planting my I'm planting my peas the minute, you know, the minute I can start digging in my garden. So I, you know, you can't you can't do it um, and expect good results unless you know you acclimate it to the outdoors. Some people do it. Some people have a little greenhouse outside and and they do it that way for a while. So, and always water from below. The last thing that you want to do is water from above on a young plant and get droplets of water on the leaves because the water droplets will magnify the sunlight. And the and the leaves don't need water. Right. Exactly. So basically, this is just this is what hardening off is, like we said. You know, the process of gradually introducing your plants to the outdoor elements, usually about a week to a week and a half. This is what you want to do, and you always want to do, if you can, do indirect sun, because let's face it, they've been under that grow lamp inside for a certain period of time. We really want to go and expose it to all the ultraviolet that the sun lets out at a young age. Keep an eye on temperatures when you're hardening off. Remember, your seedlings are very, very vulnerable to frost damage. 
Even things that can tolerate frost when they're mature can't necessarily tolerate frost and cold temperatures when they're young. And like we said, following this process will help reduce the chances of sun scald and transplant shock. And this is now where we're going to switch over to the video. If I have a pointer. Because okay? it gives your plants a head start, even if the weather outside is warm, resulting in earlier and longer harvests than would otherwise be possible. It's particularly good for tender crops such as tomatoes, peppers and squash. For best results, follow these top tips. Use a good seed starting soil. It needs to be fine and moisture retentive so that the young seedlings don't dry out. That's that sterile medium we were talking about. Planted yeah. at a depth of one to two times the size of their longest edge, and they need the soil above them to be gently firmed down. Then, water them with a fine roast watering can or spray. Yeah. The soil needs to be fully moistened, but not waterlogged, so that they also have air and don't rot. Seeds need warmth to germinate. So use a maximum minimum thermometer to find somewhere in your house at the temperature indicated on the seed packet. However, warm soil does tend to dry out quickly. So to prevent this, you can either cover them with a plastic bag or regularly check and water them. I see how he's doing it in the closet the seed because of will usually tell you how many days it takes for them to germinate. But you need to check daily because as soon as they emerge, you will need to transfer them to somewhere with good, strong, natural light. A very common mistake is to place the seeds on a windowsill, which often doesn't give the same strength of light as growing outdoors. This produces leggy seedlings, and once they've started off badly, they will find it hard to recover. Most houses are already warm enough for seeds to grow, so if you're going to buy a propagator, it's better to choose full spectrum grow lights to supplement light. Those are onion seed seed ways in the back. Especially They're supposed to be winter and early spring. Yes, I have some growing There's leeks no too. starting yeah. seeds too early only to find that they've outgrown their pots before the weather has warmed up enough outside. And starting seeds too late can mean they don't have time to properly develop. That timing is everything. That's where our garden planner can help. It looks up your nearest weather station and uses climate data for your specific location to calculate the best range of planting dates for each crop. On the plant list, the blue bars indicate the range of dates that you can start the seeds indoors, and the green bars indicate when they can be transplanted outside or sown directly into the soil. For example, for my location, the garden planner shows that I need to start onions from you seed can find that on spring, then um, tomatoes a few weeks later. Farmersalmanac.com, something like that, for zone 6A. Later. We don't Spender have this, we're not selling this garden planner. Eric just picked this because it had some yeah. uh, good content. Yeah, this is one of the better videos I found. You can ignore this garden planner. Should always be sown directly into this the is obviously for the UK. You can hear so from that's why accent. they don't have blue bars for sowing indoors. Sometimes sowing indoors is optional. For example, with peas and beans, indoor sowings are mainly used if you want to get an early crop. But later sowings are usually direct into the That's soil. Right, yeah. So the garden planner shows longer green bars for when you can sow them directly. Experienced gardeners always hedge their bets. Successful gardening depends on so many factors. Is the season unusually warm or cold this year? Are your first seedlings going to be eaten by pests like slugs or birds? That's why it's a good idea to sow seeds in small batches a few weeks apart. Our garden planner calculates how many plants you can fit into the area you have so that you know just how many are required, though it's always wise to raise a few extras as backups. For example, if I need five tomato plants, I will usually sow ten seeds over a few weeks and will then pick the strongest looking seedlings to actually plant in the garden. After a few weeks, the seedlings will have developed their second set of leaves, called their true leaves, because these are the ones that look like the final plant. At this stage, and before their roots get entangled, it's good to transfer the best ones into their own pots. To do this, first repair the new pot, making a suitable sized hole. Then use something like a teaspoon to gently ease out the young plant's roots. 
always pick up the seedling by one you'll, of the you'll break those if you're not don't because squeezing the stem at this early you're not really careful good general rule is which carry a, a, a suitable size bowl usually you want it roots, twice the size of the root ball of the plant yeah transplanting. so aim for the minimum of disturbance taking as much soil as possible with the seedling yeah then gently firm around it in the new pot to remove air pockets it may seem obvious but many gardeners forget to label each pot and then have trouble identifying it. Oh, I've never done that. Note down the variety you are growing and dates such as when the seed was sown and transplanted so that you can learn which ones performed best. In our garden planner, you can keep notes on the plant list which will help you with planning next year. Seedlings grown indoors are vulnerable to a lack of moisture, nutrients or warmth. Just like an intensive care unit, you need to make sure that you supply everything they need, so check on them at least once a day. Push your thumb into the soil or pick up the pot to feel how much water it contains. Check that they have enough light and warmth. Going from intensive care straight into cold outdoor conditions is a shock few seedlings can survive. As the plants get larger, gradually introduce them to outside conditions, a process known as hardening them off. Take them outside for just one hour a day at first. Then increase this each day over a period of a week or more until they are finally ready to be planted. That's a nice a root ball. Look at that. Is an excellent halfway house if the soil isn't quite ready for them. By following these tips, you'll give your seedlings the very best chance of survival and set yourself up for a great harvest. Here are just a couple of the links to my three favorite seed companies, Johnny's, Burpee, and Park Seed. What started as a passion to make something original? That's nice. So, and that is, that's the presentation. Anybody have any questions on anything we cover or just gardening in general? Yes? Uh, have you ever used compostable pots? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any tips for that or is it? I have a tip. A tip is, um, first of all, um, when you plant them, you plant the whole pot, right? When you plant the pot, don't let any of the outside rim stick up because it, it, okay. it, uh, it will dry out the plant. So you just got to make sure you have to rip the, the outside on and, and bury the whole, the whole plant, the whole uh, pot in okay. there. So, yeah. That's about the only thing. They work fairly well. I mean, I don't have any issues. You don't use them, right? No, I don't. Yeah. Any well, issue, well, any some, well, you know, sometimes if you go to, you know, if you get a plant from like Walmart or something, Bonnie, Bonnie will ship their plants in the biodegradable compostable pots. Yeah. But, yeah. I don't actually start my seeds in them, but if I buy an already established plant, it's usually in one of those. I buy them. Sometimes I buy them by the by the hundred um, packs. You know, I, I mean, I I order, I have a huge garden, so, I and I and I grow probably fifty different things, not all take, but I. If I'm going to teach about gardening, I have to try to, you know, do my research and grow just about everything I can try to grow. So, um, that's that's it. Yeah. What's and, your thought about those things that you buy at like Walmart, different places have that are already that looks like the cells already has the uh, the medium in it? Is that the growing medium about the same as what you buy in a bag? Probably. Mm -hmm. another, it, yeah. it probably is, and it costs a lot more. Um, I mean, they're like 20, if you get, you can actually get um, pretty, pretty fancy ones. You get ones that you have to water once and it's got this thing that kind of wicks up mm -hmm. and um, they call them self-watering. Yeah. Uh, they're like 20 bucks. So, so yeah, you, you, you pay for those. Yeah. But once they, once they graduate from the small, uh, you know, the multi-cell, um, they're going to grow out of that pretty fast, probably before you can plant them outside. So a lot of times, as that gentleman did on the video, you plant them into their individual, their individual cups. And when you do that, you can use anything. You can use your old yoga cups. You can cut, cut those nasty water bottles that are so unfriendly to the environment. As long as you poke a couple of holes in the bottom and let them drain, you can give a lot of Otherwise, you know, stuff you would throw in the trash and give it a give it a second life. 
So I used to do those water bottles, well, like Kate said, if you drill maybe five or six holes in the bottom so they have drainage, but I also thought they were cool too because it took all the guesswork out of when the next time the transplant was because you could actually see the root ball. Through you can the see the roots coming, coming. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're nasty anyway. I mean, you, I, I, I try not to use them anyway, you know, but uh, because they say that they're doing a number on the oceans and all that, but, you know, if you give it a second life. And then what I do is before I plant, um, I just cut the side of it and, and pull the, the plant yep, out. Exactly. You know, cut it. Yep. So, yeah. What is the best place to buy a lot of these supplies? Um, you can get them at Walmart on the cheap. Um, I personally like giving my money to a mom and pop garden center, but that's just me. Um, I got this. I got this particular um, 36 pack. I got this from Walmart, but you can go to Home Depot or to Lowe's, or to any garden center. The prices will vary, but the concept is the same. Just just to let you know, we, we actually had one. I think you have a seed, you have a seed exchange. What do you, what do you have here for seeds? And how does that work? Um, you can go uh, choose, I think, up to 10 packages. You're supposed to uh, put your name in the book and, and um, say, check off what you took. Um, but you don't have <laughs> and, uh, and then you, when you plant, you harvest your own seeds and bring them back to the library? Is that the way it's supposed to work? The idea is, is it to do that if you wish. You don't have to. Mm -hmm. And certain seed groups are harder to do that with. So, so uh, you have to go for the easy. Right, right. I hear you. Yeah. So what we do... But not many people are bringing back seeds, so we are yeah. not purchasing seeds. I heard that. Yeah, I heard that from, from Bellingham. So what we do every year, and we'll be having one next year, is we have a seed swap. This year we had one in Bellingham. It was the first one. People didn't really understand what it was, but you bring your last year's seeds, because basically seeds are good for more than a year. You bring your last year's seeds in, and, um, and you know, we've got a lot of different kinds. I got some daikons, I guess, which are long, white... Um, uh, radishes and all kinds of stuff, you know. So we we traded. That's that's the best way to cut down on your on the price you spend for uh, for seeds. So just swap them. Did a lot of people show up? No, we had probably six, six, yeah. eight or something. Not a lot. Weather wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was it was, it was it was it was in was it February eighth? I think is when we had it. Yeah. yeah there weren't there weren't too many people that came. I think it was kind of nasty out. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was. It but was, next it was, year it was rainy and it was cold. And I want to do it early because. Um, people should start planting their gardens long before they do them. You know, you got to plan everything out. So, mm -hmm. I like I like to get it done early. Yeah. And next year, Kate's already promised to deliver seventy degrees and sunny on the day. That's, of the that's right. February. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Right. That was right. My next right. Question. We're, we're going. We're flying down to Florida. What's a good resource to try to figure out? If I can I'll give you some it. stuff, Kathy. Yep. To touch base with me offline. We have a deck on that and a PowerPoint presentation yep. on that. So, any other questions? Anybody else? Anything? This was great. All right. Well, thank you very much.